<clears throat> in the previous lecture, we learned that electrical charges give rise to forces. We learned that those forces can be attractive or repulsive. And we also learned that those forces um, are long range. It's not a contact force like friction, like tension, like air resistance or drag. It is a long-range force like gravity. The Earth does not have to touch this piece of chalk in order to exert a force on it. Similarly, two charged objects do not need to touch in order to experience forces. We're going to learn some analytical tools for analyzing that force. And namely, we're going to learn about Coulomb's Law. Coulomb's Law is a mathematical equation which can help us wrap our brains around those forces that we were observing. So here is Coulomb's Law, and you can see it is an equation. Um, it looks a lot like Newton's Universal Law of Gravitation, which we learned about in the first semester of this course. It is a constant times the charge of the first object times the charge of the second object divided by the separation between the two charges squared. Again, very similar in form to Newton's Law of Gravitation. Now, What's similar is that electrical forces are also long range, but something that's very different is that there's only one type of mass. There's only positive mass, and we only have attractive gravitational forces. With electricity, we can have attractive or repulsive forces, and we have two kinds of charge, positive and negative. So this equation helps us to understand, uh, or helps us to calculate the magnitude of the forces between two charges. A couple of things to notice. Don't forget Newton's third law from way back in the last semester. If charge one exerts a force on charge two, then guess what? Charge two exerts the exact same force. Well, the exact same magnitude, opposite direction, force on charge one. So if one affects two, then two affects one. Every time, always. And that's uh, summed up here when I say that F1 on two is exactly the same as F2 on one. The magnitude is exactly the same as F2 on 1. Um, and so, again, this is the equation for the magnitude of the electrical force. Here we see uh, two charges that are like charges will repel. Whether they are positives or negatives, they'll repel. And opposite charges will attract. This K is just a constant. 8.99 times 10 to the 9th newtons times meters squared per coulomb squared. It just makes all the units work out. No big deal. Let's practice using this equation a little bit. So I have a series of clicker questions here. Um, obviously, we're not in class. We don't have our clickers with us. But I think you can still use them to great benefit if you pause the video, think about it, try and come up with an answer. If you have um, people you like to study with, you can talk to them about it, a peer group. That would be wonderful. Co try and come up with an answer and then proceed with the video and see if you were correct. Okay, so here we have a small positive charge placed at the black dot. In which case is the force on the small positive charge the largest? Well, why don't you pause the video, think about it, and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so welcome back. Looking at this, we see that we have different distances, separations between the charges, and different charges. Let's go back and look at the equation and see if we can't wrap our brain around this. Now, a couple of things. One thing to note here is that r is not the radius of whatever round thing is in the problem. Students always see r, they want to call it the radius, and they just want to plug in whatever radius is given in the problem. We need to be careful. That will often be the case. However, in this case, r does not really mean radius. In this case, r means the separation between the two charges. So, we see that the force goes down with increased separation, and the force goes up with increased charges. Okay, so this is our situation we've got here. And don't forget Coulomb's Law, right? Coulomb's Law says that the force is equal to K times Q1, Q2 over R squared. And I did drop my absolute value signs in this case because it tells us in the problem that all of our charges are positive. So we can just drop that absolute value sign and roll with it like this. So let's look at this. In situation A, we have a Q and an R, right? So we'll call that just sort of our standard situation. We'll call this F sub A. Now, notice in B, in situation B, we have twice the charge and twice the radius. 
twice the separation, I should say. So, <clears throat> so doubling the charge adds a two on the top. Doubling the separation adds a two squared or a four on the bottom. And so the charge, the force in situation B is actually one half of the force in situation A. How about situation C? In situation C, we change the charge by doubling it and we leave the radius the same, or excuse me, leave the separation the same. And so for situation C, we see that we have a force that is equal to two times FA. And in situation D, we're doubling the separation, keeping the charge the same. Doubling the separation is like putting a two squared on the bottom. And so we end up with situation D gives us one fourth the force in A. Going back to our question, it asks, in which case is the force the largest? Looking here, oh, this one is twice of FA. This is the largest force. And indeed, PowerPoint agrees. Okay. How about this one? All the charges in the diagrams below are equal magnitude. In each case, a small positive charge is placed at the blank dot. In which of the cases is the force on the charge to the right? Well, let's go ahead and uh, well, why don't you think about what the direction of the force is on each of these, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, we're back. Now, uh, we've got, a, remember, a positive charge at the dot. So, what we should do then is we need to think about the forces on a small positive charge located at the dot. We have to be careful here, because there are three charges in each of these situations. So we have charges between these two char excuse me. So we have forces between these two particles, we have forces between these two, and we have forces between these two. But you know what? I didn't ask about the forces on this charge. I didn't ask about the forces on this charge. I only asked about the force on the charge at the black dot. So we have to be very careful. There's forces on all three particles in each of these situations, but I've only asked you about the forces on one of them specifically right here at the black dot. So let's go ahead and we'll let this guy be yellow and this one will be red. Okay, looking over here, we know that this is a positive charge and so opposites repel. The force on this dot right here then will be to the right. So we have to the right a force and I will draw it that big. Now, we have an attractive force between the positive charge at the dot and the negative charge right here, opposites attract. And so that force will be going to the left. Now, how does this magnitude compare to this? Well, the negative charge is closer than the positive charge. In fact, it's about half as far away. So I expect the magnitude of that force to be about four times as big. So our arrow here should go like, Something like that. That's interesting. How about here? Attractive, right? Attractive, but far away. So that one should be small. Positive and positive is repulsive and big. Back to here. We're going to go ahead and let this one. Coming over here, a positive and a positive, that repels, it is the close, so this is the long arrow. And we also have repulsion here, oh gosh. Okay, so both of those are in the same direction. Here, we have attraction between these two, and it's close, so we have a big arrow. And we have attraction between these two, so we have a nice big arrow. So, what direction is the total force here? F net here, oh, F net here is to the left. F net here to the right. F net here to the left. And what is the F net here? 
Well, that would be zero. Okay, so we see here that indeed for situation B, our F net is to the right. So here we're really looking at um, a couple of things. First of all, the direction of that force. Remember, opposites attract, like repels, but also the magnitude. And so even though we didn't calculate any numbers here, we use some proportional thinking to recognize that an object that is twice as far away will exert one quarter of the force. Okay, let's dive into a numerical example. 2.1 gram honeybees each acquire a charge of 23 picocoulombs as they fly back to their hive. As they approach the hive entrance, they are one centimeter apart. First question is, did the honeybee gain or lose protons or electrons? What do you think about that? Well, it acquired a positive charge. Therefore, the honeybee must have lost electrons. Remember, it is the electrons that move in general. It is not the protons that move, because the protons are tightly bound within the atomic nucleus. So this honeybee lost electrons. How many? Well, here we're going to use an equation that will come up again and again this semester. You used it last semester, too. Um, and it's not specific to static electricity or to electrical charges. It's just in general. We can say the number of packages equals the total amount divided by the amount per package. Okay, so that's an equation that we can use in all sorts of situations, right? Um, if I have uh, 36 ounces of soda and each of my cans of soda holds 12 ounces, then I have 36 divided by 12 equals three cans of soda, right? So this would work for any type of situation here. Now, in this case, what we're talking about is the number of electrons. So this is another important part of our charge model. Charge is an intrinsic property of some types of matter. Electrons and protons being the two that we're going to talk about the most. Electrons and protons have exactly equal and exactly opposite charges. And the charge of an electron, as stated in the example here, is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. An interesting thing is that that is what we call the fundamental charge. Because as far as we know, nowhere in the universe could you hand me a little package that had half of that charge in it. You couldn't do it. Because that's how big of a package charge comes in. So you can have two times that charge, or three times, or four, or 1,478 times that charge, but you cannot have 1.4 times that charge, or one half of that charge, or one third of that charge. That's why we call it the fundamental charge. And as far as we know, every electron in the entire universe carries that charge. Every proton carries that exact same charge. Okay, so how many electrons? Well, this honeybee acquired a charge of 23 picocoulombs. So that is 23 times 10 to the negative 12th coulombs divided by the charge on an electron, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Now we have to be careful. That is the charge on a proton. Uh, I am using a positive value here. It's the absolute value of the charge on an electron. And so by moving this much charge, um, we gave the honeybee a positive charge and we gave whatever it rubbed on the, uh, I suppose the flower, a negative charge. At any rate, this is how many electrons were transferred. And then we run our calculator and we get 1.4 times 10 to the So that's how many electrons moved off of this honeybee. What is the magnitude of the repulsive force between the two bees? Let me clear a little room on the board. 
Be right back. Okay, so now it's asking us for a numerical number. It says, what is the magnitude of the repulsive force between the two Bs? Well, let's go ahead and write some information down. We know that the charge on each B is 23 picocoulombs. So that's 23 times 10 to the negative 12 coulombs. Um, we also know that they are one centimeter apart. And so that means that R is 0 0.01 meters. So that's really the information that we need. And it just says, calculate the repulsive force between the two Bs. So at this point, we really can just plug into our Coulomb's Law equation, which says that the force equals K times Q1, Q2. And we better be careful. We want to always use the absolute value here. Anytime you're doing a Coulomb's Law problem, you want to use absolute values here. So you'll always get a positive number out. And then you want to look at it and use your brain and our strategies, likes repel, opposites attract, to figure out the direction. So in this case, we're just going to calculate the magnitude here. Okay, well, I better go down to this new, a new line here. Our K is that constant, 8.99. And then we're going to multiply it by these charges, which are 23 picocoulombs. So that's 23 times 10 to the negative 12 coulombs. We're going to multiply another one of those on here. Uh, now, since these are both identical, I'm just going to write that as squared. And we're going to divide by 0 0.01 meters squared. And I'm going to come up with a number, and that number is from my calculator, 4.78 times 10 to the negative 8. Okay, so that is uh, indeed a pretty small number. It says, how does this compare with their weight? Um, it says we've got a 0.1 gram honeybee. So what is the weight of a 0.1 gram honeybee? Well, we know that W equals mg. And so our 0.1 gram honeybee, well, that's W equals 0 0.1 times 10 to the negative third kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. So W then equals 0 0.00098. Now that is a pretty small number, but notice it's a lot bigger than this. Um, this is something like 1 20,000th. about one twenty thousandth of its weight. All right, here's another question for you. What is the direction of the net force on the charge at the lower left? So we're looking for this charge right here. What is the direction of the net force on this charge? I want you to pause the recording. Uh, you might want to draw a quick picture, see if you can't figure this out. Okay, let's dive in here. I've, I've, I've reproduced the picture over here. And to remind you, we are looking for the charge on, or excuse me, we are looking for the force on this charge right here. So I'll remind you that Coulomb's Law only works for interactions between two objects. The fact is, is we don't even have an equation that could do all of this all at once. We only have equations that can deal with interactions between two objects at a time. And if you want to do more than that, well, then you need to uh, deal with each interaction individually and then use what we call the principle of superposition to combine all of those.
interactions. Again, we can only deal with two at a time. And the other key thing to remember here is that there is a force on this particle, there's a force on this charge, there's a force on this charge, and there is a total force on this charge. I only asked you in this problem about one of those. I only asked you about the force on this charge. So we're going to not worry about the forces on these other charges, though they do exist, and in another problem I might ask you about them. So let's just go through here and see what are the directions of the vectors for each of these forces. So for force number one, which is the interaction between this charge here and charge number one, they are like charges, like charges repel, so F1 must be something like this. Um, let's jump over here to F3, again, like charges repel, F3 must be pointed over here. For this one, it does have twice the charge, but it's a little bit farther away. It turns out it's the square root of 2 farther away. If I put a square root of 2 on the bottom here, square root of 2 squared is 2. The 2 on the top from doubling the charge cancels the 2 on the bottom. We end up with actually the same magnitude in this direction. So there's our F2. Well, we can see now that the resultant of these three vectors must be in that direction. So we're going back to the PowerPoint. Indeed, we see that it is in that direction. One last example, uh, specifically to Coulomb's law here. And this is, what is the direction of the net force on the charge at the top? So we're looking for the direction on, of the force on this charge right here. Well, once again, Coulomb's law only allows us to deal with interactions between pairs. So we're going to have to deal with this pair first, and then this pair, and then we'll find the resultant vector. If we call this charge 1 and this charge 2, then we see that F1 is repulsive, and it's along a line here. F1 must look like that. We see that the interaction between these two is attractive because they are opposites, so an attractive force must look something like that. Now we can use the parallelogram rule. You could also, of course, do tip to tail. We can use the parallelogram rule to see that the net force here is in that direction. So, going back to the PowerPoint, indeed, we see that it is in that direction.